Give him praise. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. We thank God that we are alive. And the scripture tells us, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Amen. We praise him for the spirit of our lives, for sustaining us, for keeping us safe, especially in these last days that we are living in. There is all kinds of things that are going on. You know, people are losing their mind. You know, people are afraid. <laughs> Amen. The Bible said, fear not. <laughs> We're not supposed to be afraid. Amen. Glory to God. The spirit of fear. You know, we're not supposed to allow the spirit of fear to control us. God loves us and he cares for us. Amen. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will be with us even to the end of the world. Today we will try to bring Matthew chapter 8 to an end today. By the grace of God, we try to uh, see what the Lord will give to us out of this chapter as we continue our verse by verse study in the book of Matthew and today we are picking up in verse 23 verse 23 we're going to pick up today most like God we pray that you bless us with wisdom knowledge and understanding as we open up the holy word of God equip us with the skills and the ability that we can unfold the word of God and we can take the word of God into our hearts God where we are sore in our hearts where Oh God, we are discouraged, where we are despondent, where we are broken, where we might be afraid. God, where we might need healing in our bodies. I pray that the word of God will become good medicine to the bodies, the soul, the spirit of your people today. God, you will lift us from the miry clay, plant our feet upon the rock to stay. Lord, I pray a, a song, a sweet song will be placed within our hearts. God, I pray that the word of God will reach to the bottom of our hearts today and you will lift us up, oh God, and you will energize us by the power of your resurrection. Even as I explain the word of God to your people, I pray that you will anoint me with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that the word of God will be rightly divided. We ask these favors in the precious anointed name of your son, Yeshua. So we are picking up in verse 23 of Matthew chapter 8. And when he had entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Now, when we go back in uh, up to verse 18, you remember that Yeshua, he gave commandment or he gave a command to his disciples to go to the other side. And he was on this side of the lake and he was crossing over to the other side. And uh, he gave his disciples command to get together the boat so that they can go to the other side of the lake. And the scripture tells us that there was a Pharisee. You remember we were studying last week where the Pharisee came to him and said, Lord, I love you. I love you to death. <laughs> and I'm going to go with you anywhere you want to go. <laughs> you know, and uh, he said to him, to the Pharisee, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have no way to lay his head. And this Pharisee, he was not ready to follow Christ. He was not ready to deny himself and pick up his cross. He was not ready to suffer hardship. And that is the reason why Yeshua explained to him that later on, maybe sooner or later, he might have to suffer. You know, he might have to become homeless. Amen. He may not have no place to lay his head. And we went into that last week. And, you know, we as children of God, we have to be, be prepared to suffer. And we have to be prepared to sacrifice. And we have to be prepared to lay down, you know, take up our cross, as the, the, the word of God tells us. Deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. And also we saw where there was another disciple that came to him and said, uh, Master, I want to follow you, but let me go home and bury my father. And we explained last week that burying your father, it was just a cliche back in that time, for people who want to go and wait on their parents to die so that they can get an inheritance. That was not saying that the man's father was dead and Yeshua was heartless and he don't want to allow him to go back home so he can conduct a funeral. That is not the case. What is happening there is that this man, he wants to secure himself 
secure his inheritance and he wants to go back in his father's house and wait for the father to die so he can pick up his inheritance. And uh, Yeshua said to him that uh, let the dead bury their dead. In other words, the people, the people of the world, let them take care of that. And there are things that God expects us to take care of. There are things that we as children of God, we have to deny ourselves as the Bible said. We have to leave certain things for the people of the world because he called us. Amen. He said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. So you should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. So as we pick up in verse 23, and when he entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. This continue from what I just explained here. And those two guys who were so anxious to follow the Messiah, they were not a part of the group who was going in this boat to go to the other side. Their confession of faith was superficial. They didn't really mean what they were saying. They said they want to follow Yeshua, but they didn't really want to make the sacrifice. So the people who are getting into the ship here, and when you talk about the ship, it's a, it's a, a, a fishing boat. It's a, a fishing boat that they row across the lake, the lake of Galilee that they were crossing here. It was nine miles wide and 13 miles long, and it was 600 feet below sea level. And while they were going over on this little fishing boat on the lake, it was late at night. It was late at night, so keep that in mind as we go ahead. And when he had entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. You notice that he's saying here, the genuine disciple, the bona fide disciples, they decided they're going to follow Yeshua, leaving this side of the lake and going on the other side. They make a conscious decision that they're going to follow him. But those two guys that I mentioned before, the scribe and the man who wants to go and bury his father, they were not a part of this group because their confession of faith was not real. It was superficial. So therefore, they didn't get into the boat with Yeshua to go to the other side. The people who got into the boat with him was the genuine disciples who decided to deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow him. And in verse 24, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. Now, when you talk about a tempest, a tempest, you know, according to the um, uh, dictionary, the interpretation of a tempest is an earthquake. The word tempest has to do with seismic action. It's an earthquake. And as I said to you, the Sea of Galilee, it was uh, 8 miles wide by 13 miles long, 600 feet below sea level. And uh, the Sea of Galilee, it had a, a tendency to have these storms that will come out of nowhere on the Sea of Galilee. So while Yeshua and his disciples was going across the lake, and it is believed that this was late at night, because all the healing, the miracles that he performed, it took place and it seems as though it go right into the afternoon. So while they are rowing across this lake, it was probably late at night when all of this was happening. And the scripture said a tempest. And that was an earthquake. You know, and it, it seems as though it stored up the lake. And, the, 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 uh, and, it, and it said in so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. So according to what Mark tells us, the boat, the, the water covered the boat, the little fishing boat, and there was water inside this little fishing boat with all of these men. I guess it was a good sized fishing boat, you know, because Jesus at the time had, you know, some of his disciples with him. So the water covered the boat and water was in the boat. And what the text is telling us in verse 24 at the end, that Yeshua was on the floor. He was on the floor of the boat, the fishing boat, and he was sleeping. And as the text tells us, water covered, because uh, in the book of Mark, I think it tells us that water was already in this little fishing boat. So it means that he was lying down on the floor of this fishing boat, and he was sleeping, and water was all over him. I believe that he was setting an example here 
for the disciples. He was showing them what they would have to face in life. And he was showing them, he was testing their faith. I think he was testing their faith here because he was asleep. He was so asleep. I could just see water running over him. His clothes is soaked. And the Messiah lying down there, cool and comfortable. And he's asleep. And I guess that the message that this can send to us is as the song declare, when Christ is in the vessel, you will smile at the storm. Amen. He was in the vessel and there was nothing for the disciples to worry about because the Messiah, the Savior was there with them. And what we can also see here, as it tells us that he was asleep, Yeshua was a man. He was not just God when he was here, no. But he was also a man. Yeshua was a man, but he was anointed of God. We know he was the son of God, but he was anointed of God because here the Bible is showing us that he was asleep. It means that Yeshua, he um, sleep, he needs sleep just like any one of us. Yeshua, he was tired just like any one of us. He was hungry just like any one of us. He used the bathroom, the washroom like any one of us. But he was God. The Bible tells us that the Word of God became flesh and he tabernacled among us. Glory be to God. So he was asleep, the scripture tells us, and in verse 25, and his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. The storm, as I said, it was an earthquake. And all of this is taking place, and the disciples is on the lake in the middle of the night and you know it's like disaster is in front of them and I guess they are, you know we can ask ourselves you know sometimes when we fall into situation we might fall into situation like these disciples and you know we want to know and we cry out and we say God where are you you know, find yourself in a situation and you cry out you say God where are you where are you you're not hearing no answer you're not seeing anything. You know, you're not smelling anything. And you're crying out to God. God, where are you in this situation? Your child might be in difficulty. Your child might have a drug addiction. And you're crying out to God. God, where are you? You might be experiencing sicknesses and disease in your life. You might have a terminal disease. You go to the doctor and the doctor tells you that there is no hope for you and you crying out to God, God where are you? I need you. And sometimes it seems as though heaven is silent. Anybody out there ever have that kind of experience? You're crying out to God and it seems as though there is no answer. And you ask yourself, you know, whether or not if uh, God is asleep, God he doesn't sleep. The reason why Yeshua was asleep here, it was because of the fact that this was his earthly ministry that he was fulfilling here. But the most high God that we serve, he doesn't sleep. The word of God tells us that the eyes of the Lord running through and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of all those whose hearts are perfect. So as I was saying, sometimes we are in a situation and we call it out for God and it seems as though there is no answer. And we are questioning ourselves, where is God? God, I need you, but you're not showing up. The thing is, we think that when God shows up is when we receive deliverance. God is there all the time with us. It doesn't matter what we might be facing. You don't have to receive deliverance from your situation to know that God is there with you. Even when we are facing death, even when we are on our dying bed and we are not going to recover, He never forsakes us, He's there. When we are on our dying bed, even though we don't recover, we don't receive deliverance, who do you think is going to give us the comfort? Who is going to comfort us? Amen. Do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the word of God said. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Even when we are going through the valley of the shadow of death, Yeshua is there with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. So you, you may not get deliverance. You may not get deliverance from your situation. The problem that you are facing, you may not get the victory that you're looking for. But the thing is, God promised that he's going to walk through with us. 
He's going to take us through the storm. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. So it, it tells us, amen. The disciples came to him in verse 25. And the disciples came to him and awoke him. I think that they were hesitant to come to Yeshua. And because of the fact that they knew that he was tired. Because he just, you know, performed all of those miracles. You know, preaching and teaching to all of these people. So I think they were reluctant to come to him. And the disciples probably tried what they could do on their own. Because these disciples were, some of them, most of them were trained fishermen. And they are accustomed with that lake. And I'm sure that they have problems before on the lake. So they try whatever they could do. And it's just like us, you know, today. A lot of times when we fall into trouble, we try to do things in our own way. And then when water becomes more than flour, it seems as though that is the time we run to the Lord. But David said that he, he cried out to the Lord early. We are not to wait until we are in jeopardy. When your life is in danger, amen. When your situation turns worse, don't wait until your situation turns worse to call upon the Most High God. It seems as though the disciples, they wait to the end. They try what they could do. They try to bail out the boat, boat through the water outside that was coming out, coming in, throwing out the water. And when it seems as though they couldn't do anything more, it tells us, and the disciples came to him. And awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We perish. That word is save. It means to rescue us. We need to be rescued. Brethren, there is only one person that can rescue us. It is the Most High God. It is only one person that can save us. It is the Most High God. Amen. He is more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, Above all the things that we ask or think by the power of God that work it in us. Lord, save us. We perish. Amen. It's like these guys throw their hands up in the air. We can't do anything else. Amen. We don't know what to do. We don't have nothing else in our toolkit. We need you. Save us. We are going to die. And this is what he respond to them. And he said unto them, so he got up, they wake him up. He got up from off the floor, soaking wet because according to what the scripture tells us, water was flashing in the boat and he was lying on the floor sleeping. So he got up, soaking wet, and he said to them in verse 26, and he said to them, why are you fearful? You know, as I read the text, I was looking for where Peter will say, you know, it is easy for you to say so. <laughs> but there was no reply from Peter. You know, sometimes... When we find ourselves in situation, even though we are men and women of faith, it is easy for situation and circumstances to wean down our faith. Our faith can become weakened when we see things, you know, when we see what is going on around us. You know, I had a situation happen to me in Grenada. I remember 30-something um, years ago when we was living in Grenada, living for a short while. My wife and I, we have our daughter. And she was nine months. And back in the day, I consider myself to be a man of faith. Mighty man of faith. Whatever I ask God for, God is going to give it to me. And I remember going to work and coming back home and got the, the news that my daughter passed away. And I got into a vehicle. A, a brother from the church decided he's going to drive me down to St. George's. And I leave with the intention that I'm going to the hospital going into that room, lay my hands on my daughter, and I'm going to command her. Amen. I'm going to raise her back to life. That was my intention. And I remember going down to St. George's, expecting that they still have her in the hospital. And my surprise was, she was not in the hospital. They take her and they put her in the mortuary. And I remember going to the mortuary and asked them about the body, and they opened up the door. And I have the intention that I'm going to raise her back to, to life because I'm a man of God. Whatever I ask God for, he's going to give it to me. Open up this door. I remember my, my sister, Lord Doris, was right behind me. And when the door fly open, you can see all kinds of dead bodies in this room. And when my sister, Lord, peeped in and she see what's going on, she run away. I went inside the room and I saw all of these bodies 
some bodies you can see like you know it, it swell up so high and I look around and I see bodies all over and I look around and I saw my little daughter she was only nine months but her body so swollen that it looked like it was a five-year-old child that was there big and black you know and I tell you the faith that I have in me to raise her up it seemed as though that faith just disappeared all I could have done was to just look around <laughs> and I say, Eric, food, get me out of here. And I just get out of that place. So what I'm saying is that sometimes situations, circumstances can wean our faith down. Things that go on around you might cause you to lose. Uh, your faith might, you know, wean. But, you know, God in all of our situations, he still promised that he is going to be with us. So uh, Yeshua, he awoke from the sleep and he said to them, Why are you fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. Then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. So he got up. He is the master of the sea. And what he did, he rebuked the wind and the wave. And what some part of the scripture said, he, he, he muzzled the, the wind and the wave. He said, be still. He speak to the storm. And what this is showing us here is that Yeshua, when he was here on earth, he had power over nature. He had power over the storm. He had power over sicknesses and disease. He had power over leprosy. He had power over death. He had power over sin. And these things that we are seeing here, where Yeshua is taking power over nature. Amen. He's taking power over nature, over the wind, over the storm. Amen. This is, this is things that only the Messiah and the Messiah alone could have done. Nobody else couldn't take power over nature. Amen. It was only one person and one person alone who can say to the storm, Be Muslim, or peace be still. Do you think that if there's a hurricane, you can go out in the middle of that storm and put up your hand and say, be still. Storm, I say to you, be still. If there's some kind of hurricane or some kind of an earthquake going on. I remember down in Grenada last time, you know, there was an earthquake. And I tell you, I sitting on the, the, the veranda of my mother-in-law's house. And the house just started to shake, this big house just started to shake. <laughs> All I could call for Dory. <laughs> and I started to run. <laughs> There's nothing I could do. I don't have any control over nature. And you know, sometimes when we look at these miracles that the Messiah performed, sometimes we feel disappointed in the sense that we are not seeing some of these miracles taking place in our ministry. I, as a pastor, I am not disappointed when I don't see the miracles that the Messiah performed taking place in my ministry. There's a lot of people out there, a lot of ministers out there who are surprised and they're disappointed because these miracles that the Messiah performed is not taking place in their ministry. And from time to time, they'll use the scripture. They'll talk about the scripture where the Messiah tells us, he said, the works that I do, you will do, and greater works than these, Will you do because I go to my Father? And there are people today who expect to do greater works than the Messiah. But there is nothing greater that we can do than what the Messiah performed. These miracles, you see, when we study the Bible for ourselves, we have to forget about what people said to us and study what the Bible is telling us. Messiah did all of these miracles so that it can be fulfilled what was prophesied about him. And he was just fulfilling prophecy. And if he did not raise the dead, if the Messiah did not cleanse the leper, heal the leper, raise the dead, calm the waves of the sea, he will not fulfill the role of being the Messiah. So when he do these things, he's not doing it expecting that we today have to do them. I can't carry no sin. Amen. I can't, you know, still the sea. You know, um, if somebody is sick, I can pray with them. And when I pray with somebody that is sick, if one of you guys out there are sick, and I come to pray with you, I don't know what God is going to do. I, when I lay my hands on a person, and I'm talking 
from my heart. When I lay my hands on somebody that is sick, I don't know what the Lord is going to do. I'm praying and I'm hoping that the Lord raise you up. But it may not happen. I, I, I know it have people already that I pray for. And I pray and I believe in that God is going to raise them up. And they didn't raise up, they died. So when we pray for somebody, we are hoping and we are praying that the Lord will honor our faith and raise that person up. But it is not within our prerogative. We don't have the power to raise up anybody. If we have power to raise up people, there are so many people in our own family that are sick. There are so many people in the hospital that are sick. We should go in the hospital and raise up everybody, but we can't do it. The only way somebody is going to be raised up when we pray is when God decides that he wants his anointing to rest on that individual. And if God rests his anointing on somebody that is sick, that person is going to raise up. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So these miracles, when we talk about, you know, raising the dead, and we talk about cleansing the leper, and we talk about, you know, calming the waves of the sea and all of that, these were signs and wonders that the Messiah have to be, have to fulfill. And if the Messiah did not fulfill these signs and wonders, it means that he was not the Messiah. There was only one person and one person alone who could do these signs and wonders. It is Yeshua the Messiah. So he, he, he tells us that he rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, now, this is the disciples that uh, the writer here is calling them the men. The men marvel, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? They say, What kind of man is this? We have to understand that while Yeshua was here now, while the early ministry of Yeshua was going on, the people around him did not recognize him as God. His disciples at this time did not recognize him as God. It is after the resurrection, after the resurrection and Yeshua appeared to them, he ascended back to heaven, it clicked in, in the minds of some of these guys that he is the son of God, he is God, he was, he is the Messiah. But while he was here on earth, many of these people never really believed that he was uh, the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. So that's why they're asking the question, what manner of man is this? They, they, what they say is that no ordinary man, no ordinary man can do this. An ordinary man can calm the sea. And if you notice, when the sea calm, when he said to the sea, our peace be still, immediately it calmed down. Usually when there's a storm, and the storm sees down. You go down to the sea. The sea is still raging. Amen. The sea is still, the waves, you know, high waves still coming in. Even after the sea is calm. But immediately when the Messiah said, peace be still. He rebuked the wind and the waves. Everything become calm. And the reason why all of that happened is because he was the Messiah, the son of the living God, and there was nobody and nobody else who could have do those kind of miracles. Amen. Those were signs and wonders that must be fulfilled in the life of the Messiah. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? As I said before, the wind and the sea is not going to obey us. You go down to the, 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 the sea and you try to speak to the sea or a hurricane is going on and you are there. All you could do is to ask God to protect you from the hurricane. But you can't stop a hurricane. We can't stop an earthquake. When in, in the midst of an earthquake, all I could do is say, God, keep me safe. <laughs> if a hurricane you know, is blowing and I'm in that hurricane, all I could do, Lord, help me. Keep me safe, keep my family safe. But can I stop a hurricane? Can you stop a hurricane? Can you stop uh, an earthquake? No, you can't. we can't do that. And these things only happen. God allowed this to
to happen in the life of the Messiah so that the people can know that he was the son of the living God, but nobody else can do these things. We don't have no control over nature. It's only to have control over nature, it had to be God. Amen. We have control over sin right now. And you know why we have control over sin? You know why we can live above sin? It's because of the fact that the Messiah died on the cross of Calvary. And his death, burial, and resurrection gave us power over sin. But before that, we didn't have no power over sin. Amen. And it's because of what he did for us, we have power over sin today. But we don't have power over nature. It is God and God alone that have power over nature. In verse 38, and when he had come to the other side, into the, the country of the Gadarenes, they met him too possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no man might pass by that way. Now when you look in the book of Mark, you will see Mark talking about the same incident here. And Mark said it was one guy who was there. And what Mark said is that this guy was so fierce and what they had to do was to bind him with chains. And as they bind him with chain, he will, he will break the chain. And you, you see how, how wicked the enemy is. The devil, he, he, he come to kill, steal, and destroy. This man, the enemy robbed him of his mind. And what the enemy did, he, he, he make him sleep in, 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 in tombs. You know, back in the day, they had these tombs in the side of the rock. And this man, he had to leave his home, wherever he was living, I don't think he born in a tomb. He wasn't living in a tomb, but because the enemy took over his life, and he had to go and live in a tomb. And it just shows us, you know, how wicked uh, the enemy is, and how far the enemy is going to go to take God's people down. And this man was, was driven from his home, and he, he, he wasn't wearing clothes, According to what the book of Mark tells us, he was naked, running up all, all, all over the, 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 the place, and he was very fierce. He was dangerous to the, the community, that they have to bind him with chain, and when they bind him with chain, he will break it. Amen. This was, this was the power of the enemy that was being displayed in the life of this man. So here we see that he came in contact with the Messiah, and the Bible said he was exceedingly fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. In verse 29, and behold, they cried out. So um, this, these two men, um, Matthew is saying it's two men. But when you go to Luke and uh, the book of Mark, they said it was one individual. Maybe it was uh, one individual that was active during the time uh, in, when, Ma when Mark and Luke recorded but here we see that Matthew is telling us it is two of them saying, what have we to do with you? Yeshua, you son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? These demons recognize who Yeshua was. And you know sometimes there are people out there who tell themselves that demons are afraid of them. Demons are afraid of us. You know. The only time demons will be in subjection to us is because of the fact we are under the anointing of Almighty God. We are no match. We in our own human strength. We are no match for Satan. Satan is a supernatural being. Satan is not God. And we ought not to underestimate who the devil is. I am not in a hurry to meet with no demon. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> You can call me whatever you want to call me, but I'm not in a hurry to meet with no demon. If I met with a, de a person that is demon possessed, by the grace of God, we try to bind that demon, command that demon to go in the name of the Yeshua the Messiah. But I'm not in a hurry. I'm not going out looking for people who are demon possessed. I remember down in the Caribbean, you know, you have people who have that kind of a ministry. And you see what the Caribbean area have more demons than any other place, you know. <laughs> I, I believe it's because of the fact that uh, at the time there was no electricity. Some of these places don't have no electricity. <laughs> and there's demons all over. <laughs> you see, but so every, every village you go, somebody is de 
demon possessed. And as I said to you last week, the devil, demon possession, taking on a new face. Like how we used to know people demon possessed and you know, the, you'll hear like different tone of voices coming out of their, their, their mouth when they speak and stuff like that and you have to hold them down. I remember experienced demon possessed people in Trinidad, this uh, brother from the church that was demon possessed. We have to hold him down and this guy is smaller than me and he will just take us and just, you know, throw us aside. And we have to hold him down because uh, what they said, you have to go and pray and fast so that you can cast out the, the, this demon. But things like that, we don't see them that much today. And as I was saying last week, demon possession. It seems as though the devil, he changed things around in the sense that he is using pharmacia. He is using drugs. He is using drug addiction to possess people today. And I was mentioning last week the amount of people who are overdosed on drugs and they use drugs and they will commit suicide. A lot of these people, when they take drugs, they're not afraid of dying. And it seems as though it's an easy way for Satan to kill people. When the, the, the old way of being demon possessed, a lot of people wasn't being killed. You know, when a person is demon possessed, they get in contact with a pastor or somebody that is anointed of God. The person rebuked that demon out of them and the person returned back to their normal life. But today, when the devil gets somebody hooked on OPI, addiction, all of these drugs that are out there in the community, most of these people are not going to recover. They're not going to recover. They're going to die. So it's an easy way for the devil to kill people. Glory to God. Amen. And it, it tells us, this man, he was demon possessed and he was exceedingly fierce so that no man could pass that way. He didn't say woman, strong men, all of the strong men in the community, they couldn't even pass that way because that man was so fierce. And I was studying and I, it came into my mind that he used the word fierce. And I remember my Jamaican brothers that has used that word, you're too fierce. <laughs> that is where that word come from. We're not supposed to be feisty. You know, what he's talking about here, this guy was bad. <laughs> Amen. He was bad even when he, he meet up with men. He was still violent. When a person is feisty, it means that they're violent. And this man was a violent person. But he, he, he met his match. And he says that he met with the Messiah. And the word tells us in verse 29, And behold, they cry out, saying, what are we to do with you, Yeshua? You son of God, they knew him, they recognized him from eternity past. And what they're saying, have you come here to torment us before the time? The demons realize that there's a time when they're going to be tormented. Yes. Even demons recognize that there's a time when they will be tormented. It's humans today who say, well, you know, after I did, I done. I don't really believe in hell. But the demons are scared. <laughs> demons are scared of the torment that they're going to face in the lake of fire. Have you come here to torment us before our time? They're asking the question. And in verse 30, and there was a good way off from them, a horde of many swine feeding. Now, in other parts of the Bible, I think in Mark and Luke, it tells us it was 2,000 pigs or 2,000 swine that was feeding. And many uh, theologians and Bible interpreters, what they're saying is that when he talks here about the swine feeding, this horde of swine, they're saying that it wasn't Jewish people who were owning this horde of swine because Jewish people don't uh, mind swine, they don't raise swine. So what they're saying, it had to be it was Gentiles. And, well, I, I guess they're right, but they're not going further to tell us when they say it's Gentiles. When they talk about Gentiles, Gentiles, according to the Bible definition, is European people. And when they say Jews don't raise swine, they are talking about those white people in Israel. They call them Jews and they say they don't raise swine and they say they are not Gentile. But those people are Gentile just as the rest of all European people according to the scripture. And it is something that each of us need to find out for ourselves. 
and he tells us in verse 30, and there was a good way out from them a horde of many swine feeding. Now, the text here does not tell us it is 2,000 pigs. So you have to keep that in mind as you read the text. It is 2,000 pigs that they're talking about here. So the devil sought him, or the devil asked or beseeched uh, Yeshua, saying, if you cast us out. Not if, they, they will be cast out. They, they, they're acting as if, well, Yeshua will just, you know, leave them alone. They are, I guess it's a trick, you know, if you cast us out. In other words, maybe you're going to leave us here. He's not going to leave them there. Amen. If you cast us out, allow us to go away into the horde of swine. They're asking to go away into the horde of swine. And what we are noticing here is that demons like to be in a house. Demons like to be in a body. Demons like to be in a human body or like to be in an animal. In the book of Matthew chapter 12, he said, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he sought dry places to live. And when he don't find a place to live that is, you know, that will accommodate him, you know, he look around and he find a place and there's no place. The scripture said that the, the same house or the same heart that he came from, he's going to return back to that person. And when he returned back to that person and he found that place empty, that heart that he came out from, that life that he came out from, he found it empty and clean and there's nobody occupying that place. He tells us that that demon, that one demon, what he's going to do go around, he's going to look for seven other demons and they're going to come and they're going to occupy that person life that, they came, that he came out from and he tells us that the last state of that person is going to be worse than the first the devil job demon's job is to destroy the life of people so here we see that the demon he don't want to go into the wilderness and live he don't want Yeshua to cast him into the sea he wants to go into a house demons are looking for a house the devil is looking to come into my heart, but you're not going to get him. The devil is looking to come into your heart. The word of God said our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He wants to come in. And when the devil comes in, you know, if you allow the devil to come into your heart, even though you have the Holy Spirit there, the Holy Spirit is not going to stay in that same house with the, the, the devil. Amen. God is not going to share no, 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 no apartment. No house, <laughs> no room with no uh, devil. If you or I allow the devil to come into my, our heart, God is going to depart. The Holy Spirit is going to leave. Satan is looking for a house. He is looking for a place to stay. Are you going to let him in? He's knocking at your heart door. <laughs> uh, in the book of Revelation, the word of God declared, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man shall hear my voice, I'll enter in and I'll suck with him and him with me. The, the, the God the Father, the Son, will come and he will knock at your heart door and you have to open to him. But the devil will just kick down your heart door. The devil will just kick his way in. And brethren, we have to be prepared for the enemy. The Bible said we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But he said we have to take unto ourselves the whole armor of God, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, so that we can quench every fiery darts of the enemy. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He wants a place to stay. If you cast us out, allow us to go into the horde of swine. And he said to them, go. Yeshua said to him, go. Now, a lot of people are against what the Messiah did here. What they're saying is that he um, overstepped his authority and he abused these animals because as we will see these animals, they didn't even want to live, stay alive, having demons within them. And what they're saying is that they're holding Yeshua responsible. You know these animal people, how they are holding Yeshua responsible for killing these animals unnecessarily. You know, but the Bible said the earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, the silver and the gold, 
everybody that dwell upon the face of the earth, everything belongs to God. And we recognize Yeshua as God. And this is another thing to show that he, he, he was God. Who can hold him responsible? You know, the, the scripture tells us what he did here is that he said to them, go, only one word. Brethren, we don't need to communicate a lot to the devil. Either. You don't need to chat with the devil. <laughs> don't go out there and start chatting with no demons. If you come across a demon, you come across somebody who is demon possessed, you, all you have to do is to stand on the word of God, speak the word of God, don't carry on no long argument with the devil. The devil is a trickster. He's a general. Amen. <laughs> and he know how to he know how to disguise himself. So we have to be careful. You see what the Messiah did there? He said, go. And when they had come out, so they came out. As soon as he said, go, they have to leave. They went into the horde of swines. And that was 2,000 swines. And behold, uh, the whole horde of swine run violently down a steep place into the sea and perish in the waters. So it's 2,000 pigs there. And these demons, they came out from two men. And demons from two men occupy the life or the bodies of these 2,000 pigs. And these pigs didn't want to stay alive anymore. These pigs decided that we are not going to stay alive. We don't want to be alive anymore. We don't want to live. Amen. Nobody's not going to get no bacon from our body anymore. We're going to take our life. We're going to commit suicide. And that is what Satan wants, you know. Satan wants people to commit suicide. When you kill yourself, it's all over. But I'm saying it doesn't matter where we, where we are. It doesn't matter what pit you might find yourself in. You still have hope. God can still reach down. The song said, when he reach down his hands, he can reach down his hands and he can lift us from the married clay. He can plant our feet upon the rock to stay. He can place a sound within our soul. Sounds of praises, hallelujah. The, the swine didn't want to stay alive, so they run down a steep hill. These swines never do something like that before. Run down a steep hill, as the Bible said into the water, into the lake, and they perish. They rather to die than to stay alive having demons operating in their life. In verse 33, as we close up, and they that kept them fled. <laughs> Who's going to stay around there? <laughs> these guys, they were taking care of their, their, their pigs, and you know, these two men that was demon possessed, I guess they didn't go that far where they was. You know, because they were bad, they were fierce. And they had to chain them up and all of that. And they were doing their business until uh, these, these demons request to go into the life of these swines. And the swine kill themselves. And these men, they get out of there. They say, foot, get me out of there. And they went their ways into the city and told everything. So what they did, they went into the city and they explained to the owners of these swines. Listen, we were all there. And you know those two demon-possessed men? Those guys who wasn't wearing any clothes? Those guys who when they we chained them up, they break in the chain. Uh, this man came out of nowhere and he set them free. And then the demons came out from them and go into uh, the horde of swine, the 2,000 pigs. And the 2,000 pigs run down this steep hill. And all your pigs gone, they all died. And they explained that, you know, to the owners and all of the people in the city. And it tells us, and, and let me read that over. And they that kept them fled and went their way into the city and told everything. And what had happened to the possessor of the devils. And look at what happened. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Yeshua. We have to understand what is happening here. This is not saying that they came out. And they want to welcome Yeshua, welcome into our city. No, this is not what they're doing here. When the people, when these uh, caretaker of the animals, the pigs, go out and they told the owners, people in the city, what happened to the 2,000 pigs. They were upset. They were angry. And they came out and they were angry. They showed it. They come out to bar him, to stop him from coming into their city because they were angry because 2,000 pigs died 
and two demonic men were set free. And these people came out and they stopped the Messiah from coming into their city. And behold, the whole city came out to meet him. And when they saw him, they begged him that he would depart out of their coast. They didn't want the Messiah to come into their town because the Messiah caused their portfolio to go down. 2,000 pigs died. And those people, they value pigs more than humans. And you know, it's the same thing is going on in the world today. You see how um, European people love animals more than people. You know, you see people, they will spend thousands of dollars on an animal that they know going to die. Take it to the vet. Spend thousands of dollars on that animal, and that animal is going to die. And there are so many hungry people all around the world. You know, people who need help, and they would rather, you know, waste their money on an animal. They will tell you that the animal is a part of their family. Some of them, they go to bed and they have the dog in their bed. They have the, the cat. They even have the pig. Some of them have the snake in the bed. And all of that because they, they value animal more than people. Last week, I was out in Etobicoke working in one of those parks out in Etobicoke. And the truck that uh, we had working in the parks, because you know these parks are very busy with people, children and you know parents in the park with their children and we in the park working. And uh, this, because the trucks that we have now, they have a beeper on the truck that beeps. So when people come in towards the truck, they know to stay away you know, from the truck. So the truck is beeping and this lady came up to us and said, um, why are you guys uh, beeping the truck like that? So uh, we explained to her, I said, well, because it's, uh, it's safety, it's to keep the public safe, and we don't want the children to come close to the truck because we want to keep everybody safe. She said, I thought you guys was trying to disturb the animals. <laughs> Could you imagine that? <laughs> she not thinking about people. She thinking about the animals in the park is going to be disturbed because this beeper is going. And it's just to show how people in this North America here, they love animals more than people. You walk in the street and somebody coming with their dog, they expect you to stop and go and pat their dog on the head and talk to the dog, but they won't talk to you. They don't want to talk to you. People don't. You, you walk in the street and everybody just hold their head straight. But you have to go and bend down and take your time and pat some dog on the head. I don't have nothing against dog, but if I can't talk to you as a human being, I am not going to talk to your dog. And you know some people compromise and they're like, I love dog. No, I don't love the dog. If that's how you want it, I am not going to pat your dog and talk to your dog. You don't want to talk to me. I am a human being, you are a human being, but you only want me to come and pat your dog. And you know, that is how society is today. And it, it, it seems as though that same thing was happening in, in the time of the Messiah. These people in the village, they love these swines more than they love uh, those two demon-possessed men. Uh, the Messiah, he uh, delivered those demon-possessed men and he sent the swine uh, the, the, the demons into the lives of those swine and the swines were destroyed. Some people are saying that the reason why he sent the demons into the swine is because uh, swines are unclean. In Old Testament uh, text, swines uh, or pigs are unclean. So maybe that's the reason why he uh, let the demons go into the life of these swines. We don't know exactly what, why. But we leave it there for today. The Lord bless us. We have to value people. We have to value human beings. God bless us. Amen. I'm going to ask the moderator to come back and we'll sing uh, silver and gold, silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. Amen. Bless the Lord.